Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India again to this next session of great experiments in psychology. In today's class, we will discuss about how psychology was established as a science. In the previous classes, we have in the previous class, we have talked about uh, how philosophy had its psychology had its roots in philosophy and how the philosophical uh, changes in the world brought about a movement in developing psychology and establishing psychology as a science. In today's class, we will talk about the famous uh, biologists, physiologists and medical practitioners who in actually involve psychological uh, counterparts in their work and that is how brought about the new science of psychology. The beginnings of experimental psychology started with empirical philosophy. We discussed that in the previous section and we saw that there was a zeitgeist or an intellectual movement that was taking place all across the world, especially in Europe. Now, what was happening in Europe was there was a scientific revolution going on and there was uh, this revolution represented the beginning of enlightened thought. And during the 17th and 18th centuries, people started having more confidence in human reason and exper experience instead uh, of faith in religion and traditional authority. So, they were asking uh, questions, they were asking questions about the natural phenomena, they were asking questions about why there were different behaviors in humankind, why people behaved in a certain way, why uh, certain phys physical and physiological experiences came about and this uh, made these, these questions brought about various changes in the world of science. The, so, the first experimental psychologist were primarily psychologists from physiologists from Germany. We talked about physiology having a major role in the development of psychology in the last class. We also saw how physics had an importance in developing psychology as a science. Today, we are going to discuss the four major people who had influenced the development of psychology as a science and they are Hermann Wall, von Helmholtz, Ernst Weber, Gustav Fechner and Wilhelm Wundt. Most of us know of Wundt as the father of modern psychology. To in our uh, following classes today and in the next class, we will discuss as to why is it important to understand the role of Helmholtz, Weber and Fechner in the development of psychology and how and why is Wundt called the father of modern psychology. Mind you, I am specifying on the term modern psychology primarily because psychology as we know existed from uh, a long back and there is a history of psychology even in the Indian religious texts. Now, we are not going to discuss about philosophy and the role of psychology and uh, its, its uh, role in religion and practice and also in the other uh, religious scriptures. But we are talking uh, here, we are talking about experimental psychology. Now, this was it was seen that all these four people that is Helmholtz, Weber, Fechner and Wundt all were German scientists and who were either trained in physiology or were medical practitioners and all were aware of the impressive developments in modern science. Now, what is important to see is it is they are all from Germany. Now, why Germany? Why was Germany taking such an important uh, part in the development of modern psychology? One of the major reasons being that Germany was a country that, in, in that encouraged uh, different biological sciences uh, as uh, or considered the biological sciences as uh, a scientific discipline and encouraged his uh, experimentation. 
uh, France and England and especially the other European countries were, uh, were more keen on studying physical matter. So, to them uh, the uh, sciences uh, primarily meant uh, studying the physical sciences and biological sciences had not yet opened up so much in the other countries. And Germany on the other hand uh, also uh, expressed uh, interest in aesthetics, in um, archaeology, in uh, several other fields uh, uh, and considered them phonetics and considered them as a part of science. Now, most of these uh, physiologists as you will see would generally would become uh, they had either practiced mathematics or physics along with medical science or physiology. Now, that uh, probably Germany that is why was the mm, seed ground to develop psychology. It was a new discipline, it was um, it, it involved uh, a lot of uh, physiology and uh, questions that could be answered by physiology and so probably Germany was the ideal place to encourage this science. Now, uh, coming to the first person who had an influence in uh, the development of psychology as a science, experimental science is Hermann von Helmholtz. Helmholtz strangely had no idea that he would be so popular and so well known in the field of psychology. Helmholtz was a, a medical practitioner and he had served the army for more than 7 years. He was also uh, he was a researcher in physics as well as physiology. Psychology ranked third in his area of scientific contribution, yet he has been instrumental in the beginning of the new psychology. Helmholtz emphasized a mechanistic and deterministic approach and he assumed that the human sense organs function like machines. Now, look at this, there is this influence of physics and other scientific disciplines in uh, these uh, researchers and you can actually see that uh, psychology also had its uh, other uh, influences from physics. So, Helmholtz used uh, preferred using technological uh, technical analogies like comparing the transmission of nerve impulses to the operation of a telegraph. So, the, it is uh, it is strange that at those point in times work was more interdisciplinary than isolated and segregated into specific disciplines. Now, Helmholtz contributions have major, majorly involved investigations in speed of neural impulse, vision and hearing. Considering the speed of neural impulse before Helmholtz people believed that the nerve impulse was instantaneous that is it travelled too fast to be measured. Now, Helmholtz through his experimentation showed that the rate of conduction was could be done by stimulating a motor nerve and what he did was he attached the nerve to a muscle in the leg of a frog and he recorded the precise moment of stimulation and of the resulting movement on the leg muscle of the frog. So, this lag between the stimulation and the resultant response actually gave him an idea about the time uh, taken for that uh, for that nerve impulse to travel. So, he found that uh, he recorded the delay between uh, the stimulation of the nerve near the muscle and the muscles response and stimulation further from the muscle. And these measurements yielded the conduction speed of the neural impulse to 90 feet per second. So, Helmholtz not only experimented on frogs, but he also tried it out on human subjects. And what he did was he tried to find out the reaction time for sensory nerves in human subjects. So, stu he studied the complete circuit for stimulation of a sense organ to a resulting motor response. And this is the first experiments recorded experiments on reaction time that have been done. So, students of psychology today you must be well aware of Helmholtz uh, theories of vision and uh, audition which we will come to later, but he was also and you, you must be very familiar with reaction time experiments, but this is probably the first re reaction time experiment recorded of the time and this is way back in the 18th hundreds where uh, reaction time of sensory nerves were on of human subjects were recorded by Helmholtz. 
Now, what was its implication for psychology? It seemed that Helmholtz demonstration that the speed of conduction was inst not instantaneous, that is it did not happen immediately, there was a delay suggested that thought and movement follow each other follow each other at a measurable interval and do not occur simultaneously as has been thought. Helmholtz work was one of the earliest instances of experimentation and measurement for a psychophysiological process. So, as we said right now that the very idea that uh, thought and movement may be involved before um, a stimulus uh, before a response this is probably the first experiment of its time that encouraged this theory. So, Helmholtz experiments though he conducted it from a physiologist point of view, it has major implications in psychology. Now, uh, as I was mentioning right now, uh, Helmholtz investigated the external eye muscles and the mechanisms by which internal eye muscles focus on the lens and many of us are well aware of young Helmholtz theories of vision and this was the because it was published in 1802 by Thomas Young and uh, that is how we know, uh, know it as. The theories of audition include the perception of tones, the nature of harmony and discord and the problem of resonance and again Helmholtz is famous in the theories of vision as well as understanding the theories of audition. Now, how we have seen that his major investigations in uh, understanding the neural impulse, vision and hearing contributed to the new psychology. How? He contributed a large important body of knowledge to study the human senses. So, before this we were studying the physiology uh, in a more uh, uh, what should I say in a more uh, structured manner where the human organism was not taken into account. This is the first time first of its kind. Besides his work helped strengthen the experimental approach to the study of topics that became central to the new psychology movement. In fact, even today if you uh, consider the textbooks of psychology, you will see that young Helmholtz theory of vision and audition are still a part of our subject matter. Also uh, the reaction time experiments though most of us did not know that Helmholtz uh, do not know that Helmholtz um, has been responsible for carrying out conducting the first reaction time experiments. We still conduct reaction time experiments till date in uh, sci psychology courses. That brings us to the next uh, famous uh, physiologist Ernst Weber who has a huge role in building up psychology uh, the new psychology movement. Weber earned his doctorate at the University of Leipzig in 1815 and taught anatomy and physiology there from 1817 till 1871. His primary interest again like Helmholtz was physiology of the sense organs and he applied physiology's experimental methods to problems of a psychological nature. So, you see how the drift is coming on. So, it earlier we were just studying physiology the different structures of the in, uh, human body and now it has shifted to understanding the psychological me mechanisms. So, there is a blend between as we studied from empirical philosophers that uh, there is a blend between the psychology as well as the physiological methods use of uh, physiological methods to understand psychology. Now, Weber explored cutaneous senses and muscular sensations. Weber's experiments are very very interesting and till date uh, we also carry it out in most of the uh, psychology graduate classes. Now, um, one of the major uh, questions that are answered that were answered by Weber's experiments were what should be the difference between two points for us to be able to distinguish it as two sensations. Say if I tell you that there are two points and I put it on my hand. So, what should be the the distance if I put it together on my hand like this. So, what should be the distance between the two points for me to understand that 
this, these are two sensations. So, Weber was the first one to identify that there is a distance beyond which only we can understand two sensations. So, there is a threshold point beyond which we can discriminate two sensations. Otherwise, if it is close together and if these are considered as points, then if these are just single points, then it will be considered as one sensation instead of two. So, Weber experimentally determined the accuracy of the two point discrimination of the skin. That is, the distance between the two points that must be spanned, that must be spanned before subjects report feelings of two distinct sensations. So, without looking at the apparatus, which resembles like a drawing compass, basically this is the apparatus. Most of the psychology students must have seen this. This is like a compass or a divider and there are two points and it touches the skin at the same time. So, uh, where, where basically the subjects are asked to report whether they feel a one point sensation on the skin or a two point sensation. So, when I am actually putting this on the skin like this. So, are you understanding this? Is this a one point that is touching your skin or is it two points? You can try this experiment on yourself at home. You can uh, use a divider um, or a geometric box uh, compass and you please uh, see that it does not hurt you that the points are a little more blunt. Uh, I generally put cello tape on it and it is very easily done and you can put it together on a point. Hmm. Just draw a straight line on your arm and see just whether if it is very close do you actually understand a two point sensation or a one point sensation. Then gradually start increasing the distance between the two points and Weber showed that as the distance between the two sources of stimulation is increased, subject reports uncertainty. So, they are not really sure whether it is a one point or a two point and after that a point is reached where they can clearly feel that there are two dif distinguishing uh, stimulus present on their arm. So, we can see there is a point where it is expressed as one sensation then there is a point where it is expressed as a zone of uncertainty and then there is a point where two beyond which two sensations are can be discriminated or we can understand it as two sensations. So, uh, basically uh, Weber says that this is a threshold point from where you can understand that there is there, uh, there are exists more than one sensation. Weber's research marks the first systematic experimental demonstration of the concept of threshold. So, the what is the threshold? It is a point at which a psychological effect begins to be produced. So, this is where human sensations come into being. So, this is where an individual may differ from another where his threshold may be longer or more than another or may be shorter than another. So, he can be more sensitive to two point sensation. So, his threshold can be shorter for somebody else it can be longer. So, that is where the individual difference starts and that is where the psychological effect begins to be produced. So, now that brings us this was uh, on distance. Next Weber wanted uh, to answer one more question and here he went on to discuss how do we know one weight is heavier than another. And this question brought in the first psychology's first quantitative law. Okay. So, here what Weber studied was the just noticeable differences. Now, here I have a 100 grams weight and a 200 grams weight. So, how do I know that one is heavier than the other? So, what Weber did was he asked his subjects to lift two weights. This is a standard weight and this is a comp comparison weight. So, you this is what you are going to this is a standard weight 
as compared to this you will see whether this is heavier or lighter or equal. So, I have another weight of 100 grams, this is 100, this is 100 and this is 200. So, the standard weight is 100 grams. So, I pick up the 100 grams and then I pick up the 200 grams and I say oh this is heavier. Similarly, I pick up the 100 grams and then I this is a standard and then I pick up the another 100 grams and I say this is equal. Now, Weber wanted to answer this question why or how do we actually understand the difference in weights. So, here he saw that if there was a small difference between the weights, it resulted in the judging or judging of sameness, judgments of sameness. But when there were large differences in weight, then the disparity between the weights could be understood. So, if the standard weight is 100 and this is 101, then it will not be possible for me to understand the difference. So, there has to be a certain difference in weight for me to understand that one is heavier than the other or one is lighter than the other. So, Weber found that this just noticeable difference between two weights was a constant ratio of 1 is to 40 of the standard weight. So, if this is a standard weight, then there has to be a difference of 1 is to 40. So, I will understand this only when there is a difference in ratio in this weight as compared to this of 1 is to 40. Otherwise, I will not be able to say. So, now let us just see an example. So, if there is a 41 grams uh, reported to be just noticeable from a standard weight of 40 grams and an 82 grams just noticeable uh, from a standard weight of 80 grams. So, say for if this was 40 grams then I could perhaps notice the difference in 41. But if this was 80 grams, then I would not be able to notice the difference in 81. So, it would probably need to be 82 grams for me to understand the difference. Okay. So, if this was 120 grams, then probably this had to be 123 for me to understand the difference between the two. So, if this was 121 or 122, then both these weights would seem similar uh, to me. Now, uh, Weber realized with his experimentation with weights, Weber realized that muscle sensations also contribute to a person's ability to distinguish between the weights. Now, how does that happen? Weber saw that if you actually gave the weight to the individual by hand, so if you just put the weight in his hand and then this is the standard weight and then this is the uh, comparison weight, the errors would be more. So, he would not be able to understand the differences so well as compared to if the individual was asked to pick up the weight and then pick up the next weight. So, then he would be able to understand the difference better. Now, here we Weber said that the tactile or the touch sensation and the muscular sensations would actually contribute to understanding the would add on to the sensations and that would contribute to understanding the just noticeable differences in weight. So, um, if when it is put on your palm it is only the tactile stimulation and in fact a little bit of pressure also, but when you are picking up the weight. So, there is this uh, change there is this tactile stimulation also you can understand the pressure once you are picking it up the muscular sensations are also sent as input to the brain and the that input is resulted as a feedback to the system telling us that well this is this is heavier perhaps if I put this this is heavier this is heavier than this. Hmm. So, Weber concluded that the internal muscular sensations in the first instance must have an influence on the individual's judgments. So, now what do we see that uh, we are talking of um, um, physical sensations or physiological sensations, but we see that these this is the first time again 
that uh, when physiologists are saying that the sensations are contributing to our understanding. Before this, Weber spoke of our psychological uh, uh, features, also psychological phenomena can be understood uh, is a contributor in actually uh, assessing things or perceiving things. So, um, the next, so how, what is Weber's contribution to psychology? We see that Weber suggested that discrimination among sensations depended not on the absolute difference between the two weights, but on their relative difference or ratio. So, what Weber suggested was the difference in weights is not because this is 100 grams and this is 101 grams, but how do we understand the difference in weight? It is by the difference in how we, what is the ratio between the their difference. Now, that is a constant. So, Weber's research showed that there does not exist a direct correspondence between a physical stimulus and our perception of it. His research provided a method for investigating the relationship between body and mind and between the stimulus and the resulting sensation. So, his is we spoke about the mind body relationship in our previous class and we see that the mind body relationship is extended beyond uh, the just the philosophy books, but has come to experimentation. And this is uh, after this we will see in Fechner's work that actually um, the establishment of psychophysics. So, we are using uh, stimuluses and we are trying to interpret the stimulus and the sensation that it creates through psychological explanations. So, Weber's experiments stimulated additional research and focused the attention of later physiologists on the usefulness of the experimental method for studying psychological phenomena. So, as you can see that we move into the uh, science of explaining psychological phenomena through experimentation. So, our course in this, in this course on great experiments in psychology is to understand the different experiments that make psychology a science. And to start with in the previous class we studied about how uh, philosophy and physiology uh, empirical, empirical uh, philosophy and the positivist and the physiologist they brought about this new movement in psychology. Today, we have discussed about Helmholtz and uh, Weber and their contributions to this new science of psychology, especially Germany's contribution primarily in the role of development of psychology. Hence, uh, in the next class, we will move on to Titchener and his uh, response, his role, uh, sorry, uh, in to Fechner and his role uh, in developing the uh, science of psychophysics and after that we will come to Wilhelm Wohn's role and Titchener's role in developing psychology as a science. So, uh, I end today's lecture uh, with the, uh, the understanding that uh, we have discussed about the primarily two uh, major forces or uh, major experimental uh, researchers who have helped to build psychology as a science. Thank you.